Welcome to episode 37 of Successful Demo. You should episode analyze the direct and broadcast aspects of home only release cars. Looking at the new colored background, you can probably guess we are going to another mini faction today. We are going to be talking about the sunny card, white hat, uh, from the third pack of the Kitara cycle. <clears throat> now, for those of you who are wondering what a white hat is, I'll take this time to sidetrack and talk a bit about um, you know the, uh, the meaning of white hat. Uh, in the computing world. Now first, I want to uh, talk about the word hacker. Uh, at first glance, I think most people associate the word hacker with um, uh, you know, uh, negativity. Uh, a computer programmer who uses their skills for no good. And I guess that's mostly perpetuated by media reports of hackers doing bad things, stealing data and all. And while that's true, um, in the computing world, hacker has a much more neutral term. It simply means a skilled computer expert. Um, and in fact, uh, if you are in the computing world, you probably have heard of um, various hack-related words that are very neutral, that basically um, you know, you know, refer to the skill of the uh, programmers, the aptitude of the programmer more than uh, you know, uh, data stealing or data mining. Uh, you may have participated in a hackathon before. Yeah, that's um, a very neutral use of you know the base word hack. So hacking is not always a negative thing, and you know the lines of morality are definitely blurred in the Android universe. With regards to white hat, however, uh, that is a term used to describe hackers, along with its opposite, the black hat hacker. So white hat and black hat are. Uh, describe the morality of the hacker. Um, white hat in uh, here refers to the hacker using their programming skills for ethical means, you know, such as penetration testing and you know uh, bug finding reports and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as to why uh, in yeah, and conversely, black hat means you know a hacker that's up to no good. As to why um, good is associated with white and evil associated with black, well, just take it from me that uh, the English language is biased towards colors that way. You don't believe me? Well, here's exhibit A. So, uh, that aside, we are going to move back to white hack. Uh, white hack. <laughs> white hat. The sunny card that has the, shares the same uh, trigger as tapworm, as mining accident, in that you need a successful run on a central server before you can play it. Which means that you want to play white hat in a run based deck. Except that as we all know, Sunny is the last faction slash mini faction that you will think of when it comes to a run based strategy. None of her other cards really synergize, uh, synergize with running very well. I mean there's Jack Sinclair. Uh, but even Jack Sinclair doesn't really reward you for pointless runs. So yeah, uh, as Sunny, generally in the early game, you want to be setting up your resource rig and your security nexus instead of running. And White Hat's trigger doesn't really fit into that. The other problem is that even though White Hat is zero to play, there's the Trace 3 that you need to beat the corp against if you want to fire off the effect of White Hat. And you're just not the richest early game. I mean, if you imagine, you're plopping down your underworld contacts, your data foldings early, you're not going to have the money uh, to threaten the White Hat Trace. If anything, uh, triggering the run trigger, making successful runs and all that, is... Uh, you know, leaves you wide open to a variety of pun punishments from the corp, which uh, leaves you worse off. Things like hard hitting news are things that you don't want to suffer early on. So White Hat isn't exactly a good fit in Sunny because of that. And unfortunately, the five influence costs means that you are not splashing it out of faction either. There's no way that I'm paying five influence in any other deck just to include a single copy of White Hat. So is this a bad card? Is this unplayable in Sunny? Well, not quite, because we haven't talked about uh, the tr unsuccessful trace effect yet, i.e. if the corp bids lower than you on the trace, what happens? White Hat allows you to disrupt the corp's hand. This is a very powerful mechanic to have in Sunny, which previously had no way to disrupt the corp whatsoever. Sunny is all about assembling breakers and getting into servers. She doesn't do really do that much in terms of de-resing eyes, destroying eyes, uh, trashing cards, you know, things that disrupt the core. We've never seen any of that until now. So White Hat fills in that role very nicely and by doing so, shores up some of Sunny's traditionally weak matchups. 
Previously, Sunny was very weak to fast advance. Obviously, she has no counter fast advance tools and no way to disrupt those fast advance operations from hand, like Baltic labels and tricks of light. White Hat solves that problem, or at least slows the corp down for a couple turns as they are forced to find the Baltics and tricks of light that you just shuffled back into that R&D. What about kill decks? While you can trash Boom from hand, there are still cards like Neuro EMP, hard hitting news that, you know, are just very annoying to deal with. White Hat again solves that problem. Uh, send them back into R&D and suddenly, uh, you know, they can't really threaten a hard hitting news on you early on. That must be pretty good. And finally, against a rig shooter deck like Scorpios, you can shuffle in Hunter Seeker, keeping your rig safe and most importantly, keeping your Nexus alive. That 8 to play security Nexus is not something you want trash from your board and White Hat shores that up by ensuring that the corp doesn't have the Hunter Seeker when they need it the most. So White Hat has a lot of, um, it, it basically covers up a lot of niches uh, that Sunny was weak to previously and that's a very important uh, point because it, you know, shows up the fact that the card is otherwise not very good. You know, you have to make the run base trigger, you have to beat the trace. All these are not something that Sunny wants to do early, but the effect more than makes up for it. So we'll be jamming the white hat into a standard Sunny list. We can't, we don't really deviate too much. It's a very vanilla list. We're spending most of our influence on early bursts, like Deuces Wild, Career Fair, and even Peace in our time. That's how difficult it is to set up early as Sunny. Uh, she doesn't have a lot of money early. The peace in our time really helps to get you there and the deep data mining helps threaten R&D a whole lot. Today we'll be playing out against the big boy once again. If you remember, we featured his Asmari Rush deck uh, in two episodes ago in Successful Demo and he'll be playing the same deck once again. I hope you remember it's that Rush deck. Even though it's a tier 1 deck and our Sunny deck is probably tier 76 or something, um, however, there are some unique interactions between these two decks that makes this matchup, um, you know, less of a walkover. For one, White Hat action, uh, not White Hat, sorry. For one, we have good breakers against Endless Euler. Remember in the Endless Euler successful demo, we talked about how there were very few breakers out there that deals with it well. Guess what? We have two nice solutions to that. Sherman obviously crushes Endless Eula when it's out. Two credits to break the six rest cost ice, that's a good trade. And even if you don't have the Sherman yet, Security Nexus allows you to save a lot of money by bypassing the Eula. Then we have White Hat, which is a trace based card that synergizes well with our high base link, uh, as well as a link provided by Maxwell James, Hopper, and Security Nexus. Well, guess what? Big Boy's deck also runs a fair number of tracers in Amani Sinai and Ash. So those are cards that we have to worry about. Well, we don't have to worry that much about. Let's see how this interesting matchup plays out. So I keep my opening hand here because there's money and card draw. Underworld and Earthrise. I know that's a very crappy reason to keep my opening hand, but honestly, I've seen worse. It's a 50 card deck. So much can go wrong. Even though um, the ideal cards to see would be the likes of Career Fair, uh, Peace Now Time, or Deuces Wild. Well, um, it's better than having all programs and hardware in your opening hand. So we're gonna stick with this. Go down to zero credits on turn one as the big boy gets his Jeeves model baroids going, protected behind an ice. I mean, I wasn't gonna contest the Jeeves anyway because I'm not spending five credits at this point to deny a Jeeves. Unfortunately, uh, my opponent knows that, uh, you know, I'm very vulnerable in the early game so they immediately get a bill going and with the extra Jeeves click install something new in server two. Now, that could be a Rashida, that might be something I want to contest. And having played the piece in our time, I think it's something I can attempt to go for. Unfortunately, I'm stopped cold with the wrong breaker. Sherman's out, but Enigma's on the remote, so I'm going to give it a pass. And drop my third money card as they score a corporate sales team with the Jeeves click. This is not looking good for me. The big boy is playing perfectly. He knows that I can't contest his servers early on and is punishing me duly for it. As I continue setting up, I'm forced to respect the fact that my opponent is already at match point. One more uh, global food or over advanced view and they immediately win. So that's pretty terrible considering that I really want to play the piece in our time that's in my hand right now. But if my opponent keeps installing something on the remote every turn, I have to check it. And if I'm going to run, it means I'm not going to be able to play piece in our time. 
Now here I'm going to clear out my opponent's hand of agendas, make sure that they can't jab any more agendas in the remote, and then go for a deep data mining gamble, which pays off as my opponent reveals only a pop-up window on R&D. So I get to access 5 cards here, uh, treasuring some important stuff like Rashida. So I know that the next 4 cards of R&D are not agendas, and I know that my opponent's hand probably has no agendas. This way I can play the piece in our time next turn without worrying over yeah, without worrying too much about my opponent just winning outright. So at this point I'm dis deciding what to ditch here. There are lots of tempting choices, but I end up ditching all the copies of my white hat. Because as it turns out, white hat isn't gonna be very good in this particular matchup. My opponent isn't playing a combo based deck where they need certain operations in hand to combo off. So white hat is not going to actually come into play in this matchup. It's the least important card of the rest in my deck. Um, freedom through equality is extremely important, uh, the card in my HQ, because uh, I will be able to win on three agendas instead of four. Uh, they did have an agenda. This is piss poor. And the worst thing is I gave them an, an Amani Sinai uh, with to go with the corporate sales team. So they trace forward me, since it was a corporate sales team, a four advanceable agenda that was scored. Uh, thankfully, with my 2 link, it only is, is a 2 credit tax. Not the worst, but it was really really annoying. Now my opponent has so many more outs in which they can win with. I'm forced to deep data mine here to see 4 fresh cards including the Ash. That was the top card that I saw last run. Stealing a Bew on the run, but again triggering the Amani Sanai because I didn't trash it first before going for the deep data mining run. This is quite punishing now. Uh, it's a 3 advanced agenda, so... It's going to be a trace 3, but my opponent can easily boost it because now that I'm poor, my opponent can guarantee a successful trace with um, <coughs> the Amani Sanai, and they're definitely going to do that. Uh, they don't have the most money right now, but given that I'm repeatedly running through the R&D pop-up, and given that they have two loaded sales teams in their score area, there's no reason not to put the rate, uh, trace out of reach of me. Uh, at this point, the big boy's credits are worth a lot less than mine are and being able to bounce back one of my uh, expensive cards on my table is going to be a huge tempo loss. So uh, the big boy that does outtrace me here and decides to you know <laughs> knock off one of my legs by sending the data folding back into my hand. That is going to be a huge tempo loss because that's you know less economy coming in for me every turn. The reason why Sunny is so strong is because she makes lots of passive money every turn but knocking this uh, data folding off uh, is a big problem <coughs> and at this point the accesses kind of balk out jinteki.net well this was played uh, back on the test server before uh, devil and the dragon was released on uh, the official jnet server so uh, yeah uh, it was a bit uh, buggy here and there but that's all I see off the deep data mining run. The good news is I did play the freedom through equality before making the run. So now I'm on 3 points, I only need 2 more agendas to win. Also I take that back, um, uh, the big boy did not end up bouncing my data folding. The big boy simply pumped the trace and made it prohibitively expensive but not impossible to beat. They made it a trace 6 and I had 5 credits and 2 link. So I was able to beat the trace, albeit you know, bankrupting myself while doing so. And that brings up the first interesting discussion point. You would think that Sunny is well positioned to deal with the likes of Amani Sanai, a trace based card, but when I'm so poor, when I'm struggling to make ends meet, and I'm up against a very filthy rich ad tech deck, you know, suddenly the two link that I have seems a lot less relevant. Uh, so yeah, I'm basically forced to drop a sports hopper here. I really want to keep it for the link, but I'm forced to pop it for the draw because I'm looking for more ways to pressure my opponent to ensure that they don't get the final agenda. So yeah, uh, it doesn't mean that Sunny is uh, auto wins against all uh, trace based cards. In fact, I'm finding the converse. I'm really struggling because my economy is just not that good. Thankfully, it's going to get a bit better here as I find two sure gambles and a daily cast of the sports hopper. But looking at the big boy jamming a card in server 2, I have to ask myself, is that an agenda? Have they drawn through the deep data mining lock? Well, in any case, I want to make sure that they don't have uh, G's model bar rights available because that uh, drastically reduces the number of outs my opponent has. If you look at the score area, there are two builds and two sales teams gone. 
The most important thing is that there's only one build remaining. So my opponent is looking for one outer in their deck. If they don't have it, they are forced to score one of those bigger agendas which will be quite telegraphed. And without G's model borrowers, they'll find it very hard to actually score it without, you know, having to advance it first, which gives me a lot of opportunity to contest it. Now I'm going to Deuces Wild here and it actually draws me into a couple of trace based cards. Uh yeah, uh, the Another Day, Another Paycheck Current, as well as the last copy of White Hat in my deck. I'm going to do a White Hat here. Having uh, made the run with the Deuces Wild, uh, yep, I exposed Archangel on the remote, and then I made a run on HQ. I then went to uh, fire the White Hat here, because I knew there was a certain card in my opponent's hand I wanted to plink away. And the big boy knew it too. They boosted the trace to 9, but I'm determined to beat this one. I see the biotic labor in their hand and I knew that had to go. I think I saw it off one of the deep data mining runs and I knew that that was my lose condition. Uh, the big boy's win condition. If they ever top deck a project view and they had the biotic labor in hand, they instantly win. They can fast advance it. So I needed to keep that option out of their hands. Hence the white hat. Unfortunately, again, even though it's a trace based card and I'm supposed to do well against it, my opponent's way too rich. That trace 9 that my that the big boy forced on me really set me back quite a bit. As you're about to see, I'm going to contest this server right here. It would make a lot of sense for my opponent to jam an agenda here behind lots of expensive ice as that is the most taxing server my opponent can muster up. Um, it would be a wise idea for the big boy to repeatedly drag me through it. So I'm going to check it here. Um, unfortunately, having to pay a whole lot to get through that server. In fact, I can't make it through the server. The toll booth sapped too many credits away from me, but the most important thing is that there's an end to run at the base of the server, and I just couldn't break it. That's four credits needed to break an enigma, which, um, yeah, that stupid shitty breaker. What's it called again? Striker. Striker's that bad. Two to pump, two to break enigma for four credits. Oh, I mean, we win some with Sherman against Euler, but we are losing big time against enigma. That is a no go. And turned out to be just in Maryland. But anyway, that took away so much energy. Right? So much energy that my opponent has a very wide open scoring window right, right now. They don't hesitate to install double advance a card in the remote, which I have to contest. So I'm saving my trump card for this moment. The Maxwell James, after a successful HQ run, allows me to bypass one of my opponent's ice. Well, not exactly bypass, but de-res it after encounter. The question is, do I fire it on the toll booth? Or the Archangel. I do have a lot of money coming in right now. That's four Econ cards, two Underworlds, two Data Foldings, plus a Daily Cast, meaning I get six credits every turn. So I do have the ability to contest the server this time. It's the toll booth I'm going to de-res, and I'm going to be able to barely make it through. Ugh, two credits remain, one credit actually remaining. I do steal the global food. But the Amani Sunite is still on the table, and I have no credits to beat this particular trace. Even at base trace 5, I'm too poor. Again, I'm too poor. So my opponent actually gets to bounce a card from my table, and then because I played another day, another paycheck earlier, my opponent just has to put a couple of credits into the trace for the current, and I can't beat it either because I access the food with only one credit remaining. You can say that I played this game really badly. Uh, Sunny players shouldn't be making successful runs with that few credits. But, you know, those were so many opportunities that were wasted. So many on steel triggers that just didn't work in my favor because I couldn't win the traces. If I had 5 more credits, my opponent would have to invest 5 more credits into each of those traces in order to guarantee a block. Uh, you know, stop me from winning on either of those traces. But... The way it was, the Amani Sanai set me back by bouncing one of my data foldings and I did not even get remuneration from my own current. That was the worst. As my opponent fixes up a 5 deep remote server, I knew there was no way I was getting in this time. Even with a Maxwell James at the ready once more, with only 13 credits, without my sentry breaker, Without a security nexus, there's just no way I'm going to be able to get past it. So I'm just going to hope that this isn't the game winning view, which of course it was. So I think this game defied my expectations in a very intriguing manner. Uh, the white hat actually 
did not turn out to be as overpowering as I thought. When it was first spoiled, my impression of White Hat is, was that it was basically a free operation when played in Sunny. Even though there was the Trace 3, which is not insignificant, um, because of the mechanics of Tracers, because the Corp has to pay first, this means that the Corp typically doesn't pay into it because you know the runner can just not fire the Trace and the Corp is basically siphoning themselves. But um, what we saw this game was that I just could not afford to pay into the... I mean, I could afford the White Hat Trace, but it broke you know, I, I it broke my economy back, economic back, uh, as I did so, uh, which was very surprising, <clears throat> and that was because I was in a position where I felt like I needed to fire the white hat off. Typically, you can use it as a pseudo siphon. If the corp pays into it, you can just choose not to beat the trace, and the corp is now poorer. But against a corp uh, which doesn't really care about that credit pool, you know, uh, the big boy constructed his ad tech deck such that it's bloody rich. Uh, and could and definitely has 5 or 10 credits uh, spare lying around ready to throw into a white hat trace. Conversely, I was dirt poor. I really needed every single credit and yeah, it just uh, really caused a lot of problems because combined with the fact that the big boy's deck was all about the rush, I just did not have time to get enough money from my foldings, my underworld contacts, to maintain the white hat trace. So White Hat, uh, in that situation, was just not very good. Um, and it's not because, you know, it's a bad card. It's just that it's in, in this particular matchup where I was forced to go fast, you know, uh, the trace is actually a lot more meaningful than I initially thought. I thought it was simply something that the corp doesn't bother pumping and, you know, you just automatically pass a trace because you typically have extra link lying around. So even when it does fire off like it did this game, it extended the game because my opponent couldn't fast advance the BU. Uh, don't forget, they won off the third project BU. They could have easily fast advanced it if they still had the biotic. Instead, it simply delays the game by one or two more turns. And that's not very meaningful, uh, given that my deck wasn't able to close out the game by applying sufficient central pressure. I wasn't able to win before my opponent one on the extended timer by scoring the build out behind five ice in the remote. So that's why I lost. I could have attempted to contest uh, the remote. Unfortunately, I was too distracted throughout the entire game and that left me with no money to threaten a run on the remote, which was why Abram felt so safe jamming the bill right there and then. I just did not have the capital to even think about making a run on the remote, not to mention having uh, exhausted my Maxwell James's as well. So, yeah, it's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, Amani Sanai is especially a big shout out. I did not expect that to be a speed bump this game, but it definitely caused a lot of uh, problems. Abram could easily boost the Amani Sanai tracers, and I found myself being the one on the receiving end of the pseudo siphon. Not what you would expect from a runner that's good at tracing, but there you go. A well constructed rich corp deck that is going fast is a very good counter to Sunny, and this game perfectly illustrates that. Granted, I'm not the perfect Sunny player, I don't really enjoy playing Sunny, but, and I'm sure you can find some uh, misplays that I made throughout the way, but still, uh, hopefully this gives you an interesting insight as to the dynamics of Tracers and this particular matchup. I think it's quite interesting, unfortunately I have to still favour the big boys deck at the end of the day. Still, White Hat's an interesting card. I'm sure you'll find many more uses for it and many more situations where White Hat shines more than in this game. It's not a bad card, don't get me wrong. It's probably one of the more powerful sunny cards out there. But you're not going to see it out of faction, so it's just going to be limited to sunny decks. Thanks for watching and happy net running. I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye.